And tonight, we've got a living legend in the business who's both a storyteller and a drummer. He has defined the scene in this country for 40 years, and without his band, the whole idea of combining art and literature with the energy of stadium, dare I say, prog rock, might never have happened. He, one of the most beloved trios in the history of rock and roll, no matter where you're from, people look to this band and go, oh my God. They travel the world. Where are you from? Toronto. They say two things, Drake and Rush. And Neil Peart, doesn't do a lot of television, very graciously agreed to do it. Neil from Rush is on the show tonight. It's a pleasure to have him on. He's an accomplished author. He's got a new book about his travels on the open road. We'll get into that also tonight. A great new Canadian band. We're here to perform live. P.S. I Love You is on the show today. Neil Peart's on his way in. Here's the bio. Neil Peart is the thinking person's rock star. As a drummer and lyricist for Rush, Neil has fueled the band's huge, complex sound and influenced the way it thinks. Over the years, he's referenced Greek mythology, Hemingway, and the novelist philosopher Ayn Rand. Pretty heady stuff for a rock band, and what a band. 37 years and still going. 19 original studio albums, more than 40 million records sold. Yeah. So, here's the thing. He grew up in the farmlands of southern Ontario as a kid. You saw a film about a big band drummer, Gene Krupa. Being a drummer looked exciting, looked glamorous, and even dangerous. So at 13, Neil started taking lessons and got into rock drummers like John Bonzo Bonham and Keith Moon. In 1974, he joined a band called Rush. Then, after more than 20 years of success, the unthinkable happened. In 1997, in less than a year, Neil lost both his 19-year-old daughter and his wife of 22 years. Overwhelmed by loss, he went on a personal odyssey, a 14-month motorcycle trip across North America, through Mexico to Belize and back. He chronicled it all in a book called Ghost Rider. In all, Neil has published five books about his travels on the open road. The latest is called Far and Away, a prize every time. It's an intimate travel log that spans four years in the life of an artist, a husband, and a new father. Just enough projects to go on to be busy, but not go crazy. That's right. It's a, it's a tough balance to strike, though, isn't it? It is, and I learned part of the secret is one project at a time. You know, while we were off from, we were tour, touring last summer, and then I worked on a, a book during the off season, as it were. And I'm working now on an instructional DVD, even as we rehearse, starting to uh, uh, for motorcycles or drums. <laughs> uh, drumming in this case. Okay. I wonder about your relationship with drumming and how it's changed over the years because you've been you've done it so long and drumming for Rush is not it's not like you just do. Tss, tss, tss. <laughs> no. I mean, there's some stuff going on there, right? Yeah. So, has, has your relationship with 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 your as a the instrument changed over the years? Uh, enormously so, in all those inner ways that might be boring to anyone else, but I feel them strongly, um, and it occurred to me lately that the band, even after all these years, 36 years, we're going through changes right now as individual musicians and thus, you know, as, as a unit of mus musicians. And uh, where we're, we're going now is in, in all of us improvisationally really interesting that we've all gotten into that little uh, area independently and the little solo parts that each of us has during the show. I just listened to Getty's bass part at the end of Leave That Thing Alone or Alex's acoustic part um, after my solo and, you know, everybody's just pushing it out there in a whole new way and inevitably that's going to um, affect us when we get together again writing new material. After all those years of playing together and you're on stage and you look out and you see those two, do you, still, <laughs> do you see the same two guys you, you met a long time ago or is it a different thing now? Oh, the shared aspects. Uh, I always tell people the first day we met, the first thing we shared was a sense of humor. We started doing Monty Python sketches, you know, so having that, the sense of humor, if you share that, you share a bond, and I, I'm sure this is true for any relationship that anyone might have. If you share a sense of humor, there's a really good start to your relationship, and that's something that every single night on stage, we have little exchanges, you know, and they're wordless often, and we just have to look at each other a certain way, or um, uh, Getty and I will play straight man to Alex, which is a natural, you know, role for us in the band, but those kind of things happen every day and every night. You know, for people, have you watched the documentary about you guys? No. You haven't watched it? Is that a conscious choice not to relive all that? Yeah, and um, I wouldn't want to watch a show about me. 
I think because one thing that people who watch it would be really surprised to know is that early on um, the relationship with Kiss and people never really would have put Russian Kiss together. Well, yeah, we were an opening act for so long, and we had a really good relationship with the guy and guys in Kiss and their crew. And we opened for Aerosmith like 40 times and never got a sound check. And uh, I mean, Blue Oyster <laughs> called uh, Ted Nugent. If you name any band from kind of the mid 70s, we probably opened for them because we were an opening act, and then we'd start headlining small halls and still be opening shows. Mm -hmm. You know in between so we had that mixed bag for a long time which really contributed to our balance I think you know we learned a lot about um, character studies from watching other people and some of the, the lyrics that I've written on the subject and thoughts that I've expressed on the subject of fame and celebrity are from witnessing how people like that behaved and handled it and in turn how they came out yeah, you know you were in the row with Aerosmith and, and Kiss when they were really partying like oh, madness. Oh, casualties. I mean, Kiss weren't. Kiss were always a perfectly focused corporation. And uh, in those days, I saw Gene Simmons' notebook of all the costumes for Kiss from their high school days. And him and Paul knew exactly what they were doing and how they were going to do it. But the softer hearted ones, like Ace and Peter, you know, they couldn't play that role with that same cynicism. And, and they became damaged by it in a, you know, a tragic way because they were such lovable people. And that's what you often see. And I, the drummer equivalent, if you think of the tragedies along the way, and I, I read biographies of Dennis Wilson or Keith Moon, for example, and just so sad because they were so loved as people, not just as drummers, but as people, and felt unworthy of that love. And you see that fatal flaw in them, and that in the in the public eye and in the portrayal of a celebrity's role, it has an even more confusing effect. So that those are the kind of things that we saw early on that helped us. Have you us. struggled with that at all? Like, just seeing seeing the position that you've been put in. I'm feeling constantly having to earn it, I think, it is a good motivation for it. You know, I don't take for granted that people just admire what we do, so whatever we do, they'll admire. No, you know, I feel like, in fact, this is very true, every audience, I feel like we have to earn them. Um, you know, that we have to earn their dedication and their expenditure of time and energy and money to be there. Every single time, you know, every show, and it's an old show business thing, but I really feel that you're only as good as your last show. And that's the one thing I do like about touring, if you have a bad one, you get another chance. For sure, and you had your bike from gig to gig, don't you? Yeah, I have. Um, I, it's part of a, um, an ongoing conspiracy to get out of the touring so-called life and early on it became like hide in a room and read books and then the 80s I got a bicycle and then started traveling on days off I would ride from city to city if they were close enough or go out on a day off and just go out in the country and I started touring the art museums of different cities of America because so many of those Midwestern cities you wouldn't expect St. Louis you know Kansas City Buffalo has a great art museum it's Indianapolis the best architecture in North America is in Buffalo very right? often yeah, yeah. yeah. but it was an excuse to go for a bike ride yeah. on the day of a show so that was nourishing for a while and then the mid 90s motorcycling gave a whole new scale to it. And I thought I can do a whole tour by motorcycle. So, and, and did. So I have a bus and a trailer. Basically, I sleep in a truck stop on the bus yeah. and then unload the bikes and just ride. And, and on days off, I can go to all the great um, scenic areas of, of America or the small towns and back roads and the dirt roads and the mountain roads and all the wonderful scenery that America and Canada and Europe have to offer. And then uh, last October, I bit off a little more of uh, touring South America as soon as I saw it. Yeah. I thought, okay, well, um, I kind of divide adventure travel and business travel, and I've never been late for a sound check even, let alone a show. So uh, I saw the uh, South American itinerary four days off between Brazil and Buenos Aires. It could be done. <laughs> It should be done. It must be done. It can't but, be done. But the, and then partway through, it was like, this was a really bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> you, because you're such good friends with the other guys, man, is it hard to break it to them and say, look, I'm not going to tour with you guys in the same way. I'm going to go on my own. Oh, it was a relief because we'd been sticking to traveling by buses then. Yeah. We all traveled together on the bus, and those guys were getting issued to fly. So this was, the, this was giving them wings to fly, really. I said, guys, I'm going to be getting a bus with a trailer and a motorcycle, so you can, you can finally go off and fly like you wanted to, because I, I never liked flying as a way of traveling or a way of existing even. So, um, no, that was a, a, like most decisions I've remarked before, a, a three-piece band can't be a democracy. You can't have two against one. So everything that comes about is by consensus. And that's the beautiful thing in, in terms of the work that we do. Um, even what we're undertaking now, where instead of spending this whole year or more making an album, we thought, well, we'll record a couple new songs, then go on tour. Right. Because there's a certain exigence. We all know we're kind of in our prime right now at our peak musically and feel it and know that can't possibly last forever so there's a bit of urgency you know I'm proud to say I'm 58 I'm a rock drummer that lived till 58 but <laughs> in fact when I'm okay the, with that when the, they just said I forget what magazine or somebody just said a recent poll the best drummers in the, uh, of all time 
It's Keith Moon, uh, John Bonham, and you. So you're the only one alive <laughs> yeah. of that group. Yeah, and that's a happy state. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, like I said, the the advancing years don't uh, intimidate me in that way. Yeah. Just the fact, like you said earlier, drumming is so athletic, especially in this band and the three hours that I play, what it takes out of me physically and the aches and pains that are, you know, subsequent to that are real, you know, and I just have to realize that no athlete can expect to maintain a prime, sure. uh, you know, infinitely. So the, just the fact that I've had it this long, and I still feel myself growing, like I said, um, in really exciting new ways and physically a new command of the drum set, even we're rehearsing right now for the tourist continuance. And even through the rehearsals, I really feel strong and smooth. The qualities that I most w would have wanted to have when I was a teenager starting to play drums. I was thinking the other day when I was um, at 17 years old or so, I went to see The Who yeah. at um, the old Coliseum playing Tommy. And I was with a bunch of friends and bandmates in a van, you know, as you do. And uh, on the way home, one of the other guys said, do you think you could ever have that kind of stamina? <laughs> <laughs> I said, I don't know, you know, just, and I'm, I was laughing about that now. You I know, think we got a picture see. from a similar, you may not have been 17, we have that picture, can we show? When you see this guy, look at that guy there. <laughs> on drums. That's about that time, yeah. On, on, that's in St. Catharines on uh, James Street. What, now, band. that guy's got that scowl on his face. What's he saying to you? Well, right that's there? the guitar player was a stern disciplinarian. <laughs> and I always said his right foot was the ultimate time machine or metronome. <laughs> and I was speedy. Yeah, I was very excitable. And I've talked lately about young drummers. See, they get excited and they play a film, they speed up, and then they get tired and then they slow down. Right. That's a young drummer's natural, you know, um, physical arc. So many guitar players, ironically, were really important in my development. But... Uh, that's a good example there, and I, he, I still remain uh, in contact with Paul Dickinson, oh, nice. that is, and kid him about that, the, the scowl and the foot, the foot of doom. <laughs> um, what do you do uh, if you love Rush but you're not sure your girlfriend does? Neil's got an answer. Neil Peart, answer polls you right after this. <laughs> As a guy who rides motorcycles, every time you come with a new book, it's nice because trying to find just little tidbits of somebody else's experience on the open road. When you mm. were a kid, did you read about people telling these sorts of stories? Is that what you uh, Certainly, uh, early fascination with travel stories, but also on the practical side, um, I came late to motorcycling and just soaked up all the wisdom yeah. that I could find, the wisdom of the road, and the magazines often had articles on um, safe and strategic riding, because it's not really about safe in the sense of being cautious, because I always say, be as... Um, be as safe as you can while still having fun. Right. And fun in and, and motorcycling has a little bit to do with the, the adrenaline and the risk of it all. So strategy, I find, is so important. And at this point, with uh, a couple of hundred thousand miles behind me, I think so often of what if is my big strategy. And um, thinking for everybody, you know, never, never taking anything for granted. Actually, I learned from bicycling. It's a good bit of road craft for everybody. If you're going along in roll cars, look at the front wheel. Yeah. Not the car, not the driver. Always. But before anything happens, in the lane beside you at 70 miles an hour or whatever, that wheel is going to move before anything happens. And little tricks like that that I learned from bicycling. Actually, I think I learned um, periscopic vision from, <laughs> from bicycling, too. If, um, I used to bicycle a lot in Toronto or uh, other busy cities all over, all over the world when we were on tour or recording. I, I commuted across London every day, across Paris every day by bicycle. So that's, that's really good That's really good uh, strategy training. Have you ever had like a, one of those like, complete brain cramp moments? I, I did a 6,600-kilometer ride, and it was 50 yards from my place, uh, and I crashed. Like, just right there, just because yeah. I let my yeah, it's common, and I have a road craft adage, not surprisingly, okay, for that. <laughs> fatigue makes you stupid. No kidding. Because I've well, had it. I end. make me stupid. Fatigue helps. <laughs> well, yeah, that's strategy to outsmart yourself. Right. Because yeah, that's that's a big part of strategy is making yourself smarter than you are. What would a smart person do now? Right. What would a smart person watch for now? But yes, it, it's true that when you get to the end of a, a long, long, tiring journey, sometimes you click off a little too early, and I've had that too. Fort Smith, Arkansas, at the end of about uh, 1,500 miles from LA in a two day ride and it's coming in, oh, okay, I'm here. And then I'm wobbling along a sidewalk and flop over, you know, it's the same thing. It's a nightmare, isn't it? The, um, the, Embarrassing. As you know, one of the greatest fears you have riding a motorcycle on the road is the things that you might run into, not the least of which is deer. What's it like to hit a deer? 
Well, it's, um, of course, it's taken a lot of lives, and uh, not to be taken by any means lightly. I was a bit lucky in that it was the whole country of Texas, and they have white-tailed deer like our ones here in Canada, but they're a slightly smaller yeah. breed, it seems to be. So I was just lucky that I hit it square on. Not so lucky for the deer, but I stayed upright and uh, you know lived, lived to fear another day because now I'm that much more fearful of deer in deer country. Never ride at night again. You saw it? How, what was the Take me through the... Oh, it's the split second. It was um, the hill country is kind of um, like limestone bluffs and oak trees and that. And there were deer all over the place, so we're going quite slowly, which is another good factor, too. Okay, okay I want to rapid fire some questions towards you. Tell me, tell me about the Church of Worry. <laughs> when I was a little kid, that was my religion. I truly yeah. believed that if I worried enough about something, it wouldn't pass. Like, if I was going to get caught for breaking something or telling a little lie or something, I truly believed that if I worried enough, it wouldn't happen. Yeah. And that <laughs> if it did happen, I hadn't worried enough. And it's exactly like prayer. Right? If, if I pray enough, it won't happen. And if it does happen, I didn't pray enough. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, Rush isn't uh, quite yet in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. How do you feel about that? <laughs> That's how. <laughs> that was funny. Is that your thing? Uh, yeah, no, it's just funny. How about a Russian? You obviously should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Well, I wouldn't think, yeah. Yeah. How do we do this? How do we figure this out? Well, like, like it doesn't matter to me, and, and the three of us have agreed on this, that it matters to our fans so much more. Yeah. So we'd almost like it for their sake, <laughs> truly. <laughs> a really interesting relationship with your fans. I mean, after this long, you are, your fans are essentially family. Well, some of them we have in the in the course of year after year. I've made this joke in one of my books, that looking out at the crowd, and then the three of us will be talking like, hey, see that girl? She's got a new boyfriend. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of, what, do you, what advice do you have for Rush fans who perhaps girlfriends aren't into Rush? Oh, yeah, I've written a little bit about that, and um, I think it was during the Snakes and Arrows tour. We were playing uh, two nights in London. Both nights, they must have given the tickets away to some connected people or something, but there was a, a real ardent fan there and his girlfriend who was so miserable. Uh, they sat like this or with their hands over ears for the whole thing and the three of us are up there playing our hearts out as we do every night and wanting people to love it sure. you can't no one ever i think gets over that kind of you know <laughs> reaction right in the front of their faces so i kind of wrote that uh, if your girlfriend doesn't like us please let her stay home or at least give her earplugs right. thank you <laughs> we talked about the magazine i said you were uh, one of the, you're the best living drummer there's another poll that would that brings your lyrics into question how did you feel when you read that well, well they said you weren't a very good lyricist but i'm sure that obviously people disagree with it but when you read that how do you feel yeah you know it, it can't help but be stung you know i don't think anyone that i would want to know would be above that, you know? And it's actually a beautiful illustration. Another author, Tom Robbins, I, I was always a great admirer of his novels, and I loved the way they kept getting better and more adventurous every time. And there was one of his, I think it was uh, Skinny Legs and All, that there was just a scathing review in the New York Times by a moron. So I, I just, I got angry about it, and I wrote to Tom Robbins and said, look, as a longtime reader, I just want you to know that your readers are more than satisfied, and I love the way you keep progressing, etc." And he wrote me a really nice answer and said, I stopped reading reviews long ago because if I believed the good ones, I'd have to believe the bad ones. Right. And I took that so to heart and I never read another review. That must be kind of so smart. You have know? you ever written a lyric that in hindsight, when you hear Getty sing it on stage, you're like, nah, I could have written that differently. <laughs> Well, there are things you grow out of and, and become better than, and, and a lot of experiments. Let's face it, when our career being so long, you know, I've said before, I wish really our first album was kind of moving pictures in 1981, because for the six years before that, we were experimenting. And there are times, yeah, I mean, I got into alliteration so crazy because I was studying the history of um, poetry, and I, I learned that there used to be no rhyme. The whole trick in poetry used to be alliteration, and just having as many words as you could that started with the same letter. So I got playing with that and had a lot of fun with it in even the previous records, but by then I learned how to use it. And it parallels our progress musically too. We got so excited about technique, the three of us. I mean, genuinely, like boys, like geeks. Yeah. And we would learn how to play in complicated time, time signatures, and we would have to do it because we could. Well, we grew out of that, and it became part of our arsenal then. And, and that's why you can kind of point at that time in uh, 1980, 81, when we gathered all of those forces with the confidence in songwriting and arranging. Arranging was a subtle art that we really had to learn, you know, and how to how to use those tools and this fun of really playing crazy music, how to apply it to a musical aim. You know, if you, if you try to sum up a country based on the road signs you see on your road trips, one thing I noticed in my travels across the states is that all I see are billboards for fireworks, for casinos, and for churches. Um, <laughs> And you've written about that as well, yeah. what you see. What do you think when you cross that? Yeah, I, I kind of collect them with an open mind. The church signs particularly fascinate me because they are often so witty and clever. There's one that I'd love to quote that said in front of a church, to err is human, but it can be overdone. 
And I thought that was the phrasing alone and the wisdom conveyed there. Some of them are really bright. And then other ones, it starts to become an assault yeah. on you. Like, um, what eternity do you prefer, smoking or non-smoking, you know? <laughs> <laughs> It's almost offensive, isn't it? Yeah, well, it becomes, it becomes so, yeah. They're just presuming that you think the way they do, and that's what becomes presumptuous in those pockets of the country that are so similar to each other. They just take it for granted that other people are the same. And I always think of what would happen if, a, a, you know, you see semis going down the road. You've seen this with big religious messages on yeah. the side. And if you think that was Islamic message from Muhammad or something from the Book of Abraham, you know, with a big star of David, that it wouldn't be quite so welcome on America's roads. Not at all. I'll and that's the way you have to think. There, there is, it's called Far and Away Prize every time. There are plenty of them uh, in this book. Uh, check it out. It's Neil Peart, everybody. Thanks for coming in. Man.